Welcome everyone. Today we'll be talking about feline upper respiratory disease in shelters. It turns out that the number one thing, the most important thing that we can do to reduce upper respiratory disease in our shelter cats is something that is attainable for all shelters and all organizations, regardless of your size or if you have a veterinarian on staff. This is a disease that we can control and we can make life better for our shelter kitties. And ultimately with better management, it means we can save more cats' lives. I'm Dr. Erin Katribe, and I'm medical director for Best Friends Animal Society. Again, thank you for tuning in. Now let's talk about uh, preventing and reducing respiratory disease in our shelter cats. So this is our roadmap for today. We'll first just start talking about the disease and go through some background. What are the causes of it? Uh, we'll then talk about some of the treatment options, and then we'll talk about prevention. Again, something that is attainable for any size shelter. We'll talk about what uh, th this means for shelter operations. So what are those impacts? And then we'll talk a little bit about impacts of upper respiratory disease on community cat programming. All right, let's dig into the disease. So feline upper respiratory disease uh, has a, a number of possible pathogens. So some of those are listed here, including Khaleesi virus, herpes virus, mycoplasma, chlamydia, Bordetella, that's actually the same Bordetella that affects dogs, uh, as well as some others. 80 to 90% of shelter URI though, is caused by just herpes and or Khaleesi. So sometimes it's one, sometimes it's both. So those, those two viral pathogens are going to be a lot more important and play a much bigger role in shelter upper respiratory disease than those bacterial agents. However, they're still important and we'll definitely touch on them too. For these two most important pathogens that we worry about, Khaleesi virus and herpes, we, these are bugs that we vaccinate for. So our standard FVRCP vaccine, the FVR stands for feline viral rhinotracheitis, which is herpes. The C is for Khaleesi virus. Even with vaccination though, we don't completely 100% infection. We do, once vaccines have taken effect, uh, it will reduce the severity of the clinical signs and, and potentially the duration of shedding. Uh, it, unlike diseases like panleukopenia, where vaccination, once those vaccines have kicked in, is essentially 100% protective against infection. Not the case with Khaleesi and herpes virus. So even with vaccination, cats can still get infected and they can still spread these diseases around. Kittens are more susceptible, even with vaccines on board. Uh, kittens have undeveloped immune systems. And with kittens, we have to worry about the presence of maternal antibodies that can interfere with our vaccines. So we, we get only variable efficacy with our vaccines. I wanna reiterate this point. We'll talk about it more later, but because of kittens and the maternal antibodies they get from their mom, those, those antibodies to a degree are protective, but they wane over time. And we don't ever know when those maternal antibodies go away. Those maternal antibodies interfere with our vaccines though. And so no matter what, we can never know that a kitten is protected. We can't be sure until they are older than four to five months of age and we vaccinated them after that point. So it doesn't matter how many vaccines they've had, how many boosters they've had, they aren't protected until they are older than four to five months of age. So, and, and that goes for diseases like panleukopenia as well. How are these diseases, how are our upper respiratory pathogens transmitted? So uh, primarily it's gonna be in direct contact. These pathogens are present in the saliva and oculonasal discharge of infected cats. Uh, are they transmitted in droplets? So when a cat sneezes, that, that those sneeze droplets can travel about four feet. So are those pathogens transmitted that way? And what's actually interesting is when we look into the research and we actually look at what happens in shelters, uh, this has been shown to not be the case. So in fact, that direct transmission and then fomite transmission are gonna be a lot more important. I'm gonna call out right now that this is actually quite different than dogs. Dogs will transmit their upper respiratory pathogens. Uh, they can aerosolize them. And so when dogs cough, those pathogens can go up to 20 feet. In cats though, it's primarily direct contact. So cats contacting one another and then fomite. So what is a fomite? It's any inanimate object, or sometimes it's us that can transmit those pathogens. So I touch a cat and then I don't wash my hands in between and I then go touch another cat. So my hand in that situation is a fomite. Common things in the shelter are things like 
cleaning equipment. It, they are ourselves. They're they're potentially our faces if we're you know if we're handling kittens and we're giving them kisses, right? So your face can be a fomite in that situation. How long is incubation for our respiratory pathogens in cats? And it's going to be less than a week. So incubation, the definition of that, it means from the time a cat is exposed uh, and, and initially infected to the time they start showing clinical signs. So it's going to be less than a week for all of our respiratory pathogens. How long do cats shed? Well, shedding can be for a really long time, up to one to three months, but that shedding is dramatically reduced once clinical signs have, have resolved. The, the important point here is that because of that, in the shelter setting, we don't recommend holding cats back after those clinical signs have resolved. You can have a carrier state for both herpes and Khaleesi virus that results in intermittent shedding um, that we, we don't know if there's a trigger, or particularly in the case of herpes, they can have recrudescence with stress. And so those clinical signs are flare up as well as the shedding. So many, many cats are potentially carriers, and we'll go over some numbers in just a bit, but it can be 50% or more of cats in shelters, even the healthy looking ones, depending on the shelter and depending on the research study that you look at. Uh, what's important is that the upper respiratory is a disease of stress. So lots and lots of cats are carrying these pathogens, uh, but it, stress is going to be the number one factor that determines if they develop disease. And so that is what we'll really dig into today when we talk about prevention. These are pathogens that we're never going to eliminate from our, from our feline populations. And so really we have to look at other strategies to, to, in terms of prevention. What are clinical signs? So clinical signs are variable. They can depend on the pathogen that we're dealing with or group of pathogens. And depending on which virus we're talking about, sometimes it's dependent on strain. So Khaleesi virus in particular, there are a number of strains out there and some of them cause more severe signs than others. And then there is individual variation in between cats depending on their own immune response. Some cats can test positive for these pathogens and can even be shedding them and not showing clinical signs. The, the common set of signs though are the classic upper respiratory signs. So eye and nasal discharge. Some cats will get a fever and, and they'll feel you know, really lethargic. Khaleesi virus can cause lameness. This is a, a classic thing that we'll see in kittens, also known as limping kitten syndrome. And, and that is one of the, the clinical signs that can lead me down the road of suspecting Khaleesi versus some of the other pathogens. Uh, certainly other differentials in kittens includes th include things like trauma, but if I have a limping kitten that also has a fever, uh, then Khaleesi virus is gonna be really high up on my list. Uh, you can see or, uh, oral ulcers as well as ocular ulcers, and then you can also see conjunctivitis, so just that really um, significant swelling around the eye, so in the tissue around the eye, sometimes to the point that it, that it covers up the entire cornea. Some strains or individual infections in, in individual cats can be really severe. I want to comment on this. So what is the number one cause of sudden death in shelter cats? And the answer to that is actually feline panleukopenia. So even if you have cats in your shelter that have upper respiratory, uh, if they die unexpectedly, uh, I still wanna be sure to screen them and, and actually do a test for panleukopenia. It turns out we can use our canine parvo tests. There's some cross reactivity there. And, and so potentially if I test a cat and get a positive result, then that, that is diagnostic for feline panleukopenia in that cat. The test doesn't perform as well as it does with parvo and dogs. And so if I get a negative, I'm still suspicious if other signs point to that. But bottom line, if you have a cat that dies unexpectedly in the shelter, we need to be thinking about panleukopenia. And when we have cases of what we think might be, you know, a really gnarly strain of Khaleesi virus in an outbreak, oftentimes when we start digging, we find that it's something like panleukopenia that's also contributing. So when we're interested in really figuring out which of these pathogens is at play in a particular cat or, or in a group of cats, an important point is that you cannot diagnose the cause on clinical signs alone. So here's three images here. One of the common mis misconceptions that, that I run into is that if they have oral ulcers, then it has to be Khaleesi. And so here's three different cats with three different causes of those oral ulcers. So the, the cat on the left, that actually is Khaleesi virus. The cat in the middle, so quats are, are also known as uh, quaternary ammonium compounds. It's a class of, of disinfectants that we use in shelters and they can actually cause toxicity in cats and, and those cats can present with oral ulcers that mimic those caused by Khaleesi virus. 
And then the, the third picture there is actually caused by herpes virus. Classically, we see you know, either ulcers on the eyes or on the face, but herpes too can cause lingual ulcers, just like the one in the picture. So what if we do really wanna look into which of these pathogens is at play? The test that we do have available to us is PCR testing. So PCR testing detects DNA of the pathogens that we're looking for. And we have a panel that actually looks for those common viruses as well as those bacteria. This is a test that has to go out to a lab. And an important point here is that if we run this test, we have to really be careful in how we interpret those results. This is a chart here from one of, of a number of studies that are available. It looks at PCR testing in cats in shelters. And in this particular study, they were looking at healthy cats at the time of intake. So these are brand new cats, haven't been in the shelter at all, and they tested them. And when we actually look, I circled the two columns here, looking at Khaleesi virus and herpes virus. And so you can see that the, the numbers vary, but for herpes, it's, it's up to 36% of cats in this particular study. And for Khaleesi virus, it's up to 22%. And we're talking about healthy cats on intake. There are other studies out there, some of them even with higher numbers. And so the important point is when we're PCR testing, even if we get a positive result, we don't know if that positive is actually the cause of those clinical signs. We can find these pathogens in healthy cats. Uh, ultimately, in the shelter environment, I actually don't routinely run this test. It can be helpful in some, in some certain situations. For example, true outbreak situations, if we are seeing disease that's more severe as expected, or we're seeing it in a lot more cats. But, but other than those specific situations, I don't routinely send out this test. The rule that we talk about in veterinary medicine is never run a test if it's not gonna change what you're going to do or something that you, or you're gonna use those results for something. It's a waste of resources, both the time and the money, and it's stressful for the cat. Uh, many of us are familiar with respiratory PCR testing after the pandemic, right? We know what it's like to get swabbed. And you can imagine that that is also an uncomfortable and stressful situation for a cat as well. Uh, another common thing that I that I run into is shelters that, that essentially use Khaleesi virus or Khaleesi almost as a bad word or really like as a scarlet letter that just once a cat has it, that that diagnosis follows them around. And and the reality, based on some of those photos, as well as as this you know chart here and, and what we find when we actually do the testing is that in reality, we, we actually don't know in, in the vast majority of cases what's causing these clinical signs of upper respiratory infection in our cats. And so you know, because there are a few nasty strains of Khaleesi that are out there. Um, other than that, you know, because of that, that stigma that that carries, in general, I, I try not to call it Khaleesi virus uh, outside of specific situations where we've either tested or I have a set of clinical signs that really, really elevates that on my list. So I refrain from calling it Khaleesi and I just say upper respiratory disease or upper respiratory infection. So what about treatment options? First, I want to comment that all treatment needs to be done at the direction of a veterinarian. I do, of course, in the interest of efficiency in shelters, recommend that shelters have protocols for run-of-the-mill cases, but all of those protocols need to be signed off on by a vet and need to be done under a vet supervision. We'll talk about what some of those treatments are there. So uh, particularly for our viral pathogens, we don't have overt direct treatment options in most cases. Uh, so the bulk of our care is really gonna be supportive care. It's things like fluids and nutrition, uh, potentially appetite stimulants. These cats are congested, they lose their sense of smell and they just really don't, they don't feel like eating, right? So we need to keep them hydrated and we, we need to keep their appetites up. We can do things like nebulization or humidification if nebulization isn't available to try to clear some of that congestion. I typically use plain saline. I don't add anything to, to that nebulization fluid. Uh, we can put them on pain medication if they have significant ulcers. I'll use anti-inflammatories if they have really significant fevers after I'm, I've made sure they're hydrated. Uh, and sometimes I'll use those anti-inflammatories in those cases of, of kittens that are limping as well. An important part of this is, is really, it's just nursing care. It's cleaning their faces off, cleaning away all those crusts uh, and, and just providing them that TLC. We do wanna use antibiotics, but essentially only if they're indicated. So if we have really, you know, really crusty colored discharge, opaque discharge, that's an indication for antibiotics. We probably have a bacterial pathogen involved. Uh, for just that clear discharge though, whether that's sneezing or eye discharge, I, I typically will not start antibiotics early. 
doxycycline is a good first choice. Doxycycline catches uh, those bacterial bugs that we most often see in upper respiratory infection in shelter cats. So things like Bordetella and Mycoplasma and Chlamydia. I know we all love Convenia, right? Because it is so convenient to give a single injection. It's actually not a great choice for upper respiratory infections in shelter cats. It just doesn't have the efficacy against the bacteria that we typically see contributing to, to your eye and our cats. It may catch some of those secondary bacterial offenders, but it's really just not good at mycoplasma or bordetella or chlamydia. Uh, we do have one antiviral drug, famciclovir, that may be of some use, particularly um, against herpes. It's not been shown to, to help much with Khaleesi virus, but if we're concerned about herpes or we have cases that are more complicated, uh, famciclovir is a, is a choice. And then when we have ocular disease, we definitely want to focus on some of these eye medications. So my first line choices are either erythromycin or teramycin, which is oxytetracycline. Uh, we can also choose antivirals. Uh, idoxuridine is a little bit less expensive, but we have to dose that one three times a day or more. So it may be an option for some of your cats or kittens in, in foster, uh, but it's not always a great option for cats that are actually housed at the shelter. Uh, there's, there's other options that are more expensive, so newer drugs, um, but they can be administered less. And so potentially those are, those are options for our shelter cats. In the case of severe ulcers, we can do things like topical serum treatments. And, and man, some of these kittens come in with just really severe eyes that are at risk of rupture. And, and this is a case where um, I actually tend to be pretty aggressive with my polypharmacy. In general, right, anytime we're thinking about medicating cats, we want to be aware of the stress that it's causing them. And, and so use any medicating judiciously, right, because stress increases lots of diseases and suppresses the immune system, uh, particularly when we're talking about upper respiratory. Uh, so I do, I, I, I make those choices judiciously, but if we're going to try to save these eyes that, that are at risk of rupture, uh, especially in these kittens, uh, it's definitely a time to, to be aggressive with those meds. As I mentioned, when I, I think about general principles around treatment, I want to consider the stress of medicating and so choose medications wisely, right? If I can do things like medicate less frequently. So only dose a cat once a day versus twice a day, then that'll be less stressful for them. Uh, doxycycline can be dosed once a day, although I do think it can cause some stomach upset more often when we're dosing it once a day at a higher dose. Uh, so, so it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, compounded doxycycline uh, can, can be pretty inexpensive, but I want to say a word of caution that if you're using compounded doxycycline, there are some, some studies looking at compounded formulations they can lose their, their drug activity over time. And in, in the one study, it was after about a week. So I would potentially talk to your compounding pharmacy, or if you're, if you're ordering, only get a week's worth at a time. Um, you could potentially try to get some verification if that compounding pharmacy has done any research into their particular product. Uh, but when in doubt, either use a commercial product or discard it after about a week. If you're using tablets in, in bigger cats, we always want to be sure to flush that doxycycline with water. It can cause a, esophageal stricture in cats if those tablets don't get flushed. Uh, essentially what that is is scarring in the esophagus. Other factors, of course, that we think about are, you know, things like cost. Um, what's the route of administration, right? Anything that we can give orally is, is an option because more of our staff can administer that. Uh, and then again, any other side effects. So the big ones with, with Doxy are going to be that stomach upset, as well as that esophageal stricture if we don't protect from that. More principles of treatment. So we want to treat based on their response until after clinical signs resolve. We, we like to put things in our protocols, right, that say treat for X number of days, but in reality, this is something where we need to be monitoring them and treating uh, until after that resolution of clinical signs. If they're not improving after some time on medication, it's time for us to reassess them. And, and potentially it's time to get a veterinarian involved if that's something that's being managed under a protocol. We have some options for monitoring them in the shelter, right? Certainly continuity of care can, can be uh, challenging, right? If we have different staff rotating through areas or if the vet is not there uh, every day. Uh, and so sheets like the one in the, in the picture here, the daily observation sheet can be a way for staff to, to track, you know, what's going on for that cat. It can also be a red flag when a cat's illness is getting more serious. For example, when these cats stop eating, well, then we need to be more aggressive with our treatments. What about isolation of these cats? With a lot of our infectious diseases that we see in shelters, isolation hands down is one of the most important things. But 
gets a little bit fuzzy when we start talking about feline upper respiratory disease. So yes, pathogen transmission in between cats is important, but remember when we talk about transmission in the shelter setting, it's either between direct contact between cats or it's because of us and it's, it's us transmitting disease on our hands or on our equipment, right? And there are other factors at play that, that are gonna you know, play more of a role in whether an individual cat gets disease, right? This is a disease of stress. And so the biggest factors are around stress and time spent in the shelter. When we think about moving cats to isolation, that actual move to isolation may cause them more stress. And so are we doing, are we actually benefiting them by moving them? Uh, another option is to treat those cats in place, uh, but use signage and make gloves mandatory. So take extra precautions, but not actually move them to an isolation area. Uh, I, I put a photo in here of an isolation ward that I, that I found, and, and that's also to call out something. So when I take a look at this isolation ward, this is not the, the picture of a great place, a, a stress-free place to recover for cats, right? Um, the, the cats in this photo in this isolation ward, they don't have any places to hide. They're in really small kennels that are essentially, you know, like an aquarium, right? And, and so I think this is a really stressful environment for cats. And so if this is what your isolation word looks like, or if you have the opportunity to, to design an isolation word, I would uh, try to stay away from something that looks like this. We wanna think about uh, an environment that is the best option for recovery for these cats and that actually reduces stress. So when we, when we think about isolation um, and whether or not we're gonna isolate our upper respiratory cats, a common strategy that shelters use is to treat cats in place for mild cases. So leave them in their individually housed kennel uh, and treat them in place, add some signage, take extra precautions with them, and then only place in isolation the cats that have more serious disease. This is a great opportunity to prioritize these cats for foster care. Foster care is a great place for them to, to have time to heal. They get closer monitoring in foster care uh, and, and that environment is much better for them. Another factor that we think about is whether or not we have cats group housed. So if we are group housing cats, uh, that may factor into whether or not we decide to isolate uh, and then our ability to monitor them. So in some situations, it's much easier to monitor them closely uh, if, if they are in some sort of medical ward or an isolation ward in the shelter. So it's easier for medical staff to have access to them. And so potentially that, that might play a role in our decisions. All right, let's talk more about foster care. Again, what a great opportunity. Let, let's build our, our foster program to have medical fosters for our upper respiratory cats. They get closer monitoring, they get individualized attention in a foster home, and the stress level is so much less when they're in that foster care. They're less likely to be exposed to other pathogens, right? We, we already know, you know, a lot of these cats, um, particularly kittens, are already at higher risk for getting sick in the shelter. They have upper respiratory disease now. And so what else are we setting them up for? So let's protect them from as much as we can. And they get socialization, which we know is so important when we start talking about our kittens. Uh, a question that always comes up is what if those homes have other cats in the home? And in fact, again, as we talked about upper respiratory disease, it's a disease of stress. Uh, they are diseases that we vaccinate for. And so if, if there are, the other cats in the home are adults, healthy, vaccinated cats, that risk of them getting sick with upper respiratory, it, it's never zero, but it actually is pretty low. We, we wanna disclose that, what that risk might be, um, but I am comfortable sending these cats to foster. We generally recommend that foster animals stay separate from, from other cats in the household. And, and I think that uh, that recommendation certainly applies. Uh, the time that I would question uh, sending these cats to, sending res upper respiratory cats to foster with other cats in the home is if we do have any immunocompromised cats. And so that's potentially a conversation to, to have with your adopters or, or, and with your fosters. What about refractory cases? Uh, again, as I mentioned before, when we have ocular disease, this is the time that, that I typically am really aggressive with the, with the eye medications in order to prevent rupture of those eyes. Uh, it's, it's a time when I will start doing multiple topical medications in those cats. If we have cats that just aren't responding, uh, we can start thinking about other differentials as well. So the picture in this photo is the back of the throat of a cat, and that cat has, a, has an inflammatory polyp back there. And so that is something that can cause cats to not respond to our standard treatments because they have that polyp back in there that'll cause chronic congestion. And some of these cats, if they have ongoing upper respiratory disease for an extended period, they can get some damage in their sinuses, and then they'll turn into chronic upper respiratory cats. <clears throat> 
these are also cats that I do think about screening and, and actually using a, a combo test for feline leukemia and FIV uh, as, a, as a true diagnostic test. If we're not screening healthy cats in the shelter, which in general, um, a lot of shelters are getting away from, uh, if they haven't been tested, this is a time that I do think about testing them and using it as a diagnostic test. We can also think about some alternative antibiotics. There's different options out there, um, but we, after a round or two of doxycycline, if we're not getting a response, we can think about some other options. And then I also think about anesthetizing these cats too. actually look for polyps like the one seen in the photo. While I have them anesthetized, I also will typically do a therapeutic nasal flush. And that's simply flushing saline, you know, into their nostrils and, and through their, their pharyngeal cavity uh, to flush out a lot of that congestion. This is a therapeutic procedure. It's just meant to clear everything out. Uh, it's not a, a sample that we can send for culture. There's just two other, too many other contaminants in, in those samples. Uh, but sometimes that alone can actually really help cats out. And again, we have them anesthetized to make sure we're checking for polyps. Uh, refractory cases are also when I actually start to think about maybe PCRing some of those, some of these cats. Uh, it's, it's important to mention, if you are actually dealing with chlamydia, uh, so this is, it's a known cause of upper respiratory in our, in our shelter cats. It's, it's not common, but if we do have chlamydia uh, contributing to our infection, it requires four or more weeks of antibiotics to clear it. And so uh, typically I'll try to get a diagnosis via PCR before I start them on four weeks of doxycycline. All right, what about sanitation? So how long do these bugs live in the environment? So herpes, it's, it's less than 24 hours at room temperature. So not terribly long, but certainly long enough for us to transmit it from cat to cat. Uh, and if we're not cleaning effectively, if we put a cat in a dirty kennel, that, that you know, we can still have some viable virus there. Uh, for Khaleesi virus, much hardier pathogen, that one can last about a month in the environment. Despite what labels might say, quaternary ammonium compounds, so quats, are not reliably effective against some of our hardier pathogens, including Khaleesi virus. So we, we do definitely have some options that we know are effective though, and I've listed some of those here, have a photo of rescue. Um, you always wanna be sure when we talk about sanitation, we need to mechanically clean first to remove all of the obvious debris, and then we disinfect. So with the right dilution and the right contact time, right? And that's gonna depend on the disinfectant that you're using. When we talk about sanitation and we're talking about cats, it's really, really important. Again, it all goes back to stress. Upper respiratory in our shelter cats is a disease of stress. And so when we clean, we wanna make that as, as least stressful as possible. And so what that means is if the same cat is staying in their kennel, we wanna spot clean on a daily basis instead of removing the cat from that kennel, removing all of the bedding uh, and, and spraying everything down. The movement of that cat to a different kennel is stressful for them and the replacement of all of their bedding and all of their things, that those things that smell like them are potentially a, a source of comfort to them. And so when we remove them, uh, that actually increases the stress for that cat. So spot cleaning is the way to go. Uh, and it's less work for our staff as well. Uh, additionally, when we're using a lot of sanitation products, e e just the fumes can be, can be damaging and irritating to, to respiratory tracts of, of humans and cats. And, and so that too is something that can contribute to disease. I wanna talk generally about biosecurity. So this is a word I use a lot when I talk about what we do in a shelter setting, but what does biosecurity mean? What does that mean in practice? Uh, it applies not just to our upper respiratory pathogens, and in fact, you know, we, we know a lot of our shelter cats have one or more of these pathogens anyway. Uh, and so biosecurity becomes an issue when, particularly when you start talking about other diseases like panleukopenia, or when you do have a nastier bug in your population. These principles apply, apply across the board to all of the diseases that we deal with, right? And, and so these are important principles for, for all shelters. Uh, in high intake shelters with lots of disease, I recommend uh, utilizing gloves and, and potentially additional PPE with every single animal. Uh, in shelters that don't have severe issues, maybe think about using those items just with your higher risk animals. Uh, and so that'll be thing, animals like your puppies and your kittens, right? So they're the most vulnerable. Uh, and, and so we need to take precautions with them. We also need to think about disinfection uh, of things like our equipment. Think about cross-contamination when we're doing things like medicating animals. So one of the things that I'll see in shelters is that we have a, a medication cart that we roll around to the kennels, which is great for efficiency. But if we're using the same syringe to pull out oral medication out of a bottle and we're administering that to multiple animals, then that medication is a source of cross-contamination. 
we, we need to think about ourselves, right? Like we are the most common fomite. And so we can transmit these pathogens. And again, with, with our hardy pathogens, like Khaleesi and Pamluk, hand sanitizer alone isn't enough. It really needs to be gloves or hand washing. In the shelter setting, I, the, the places that I think about these things are any time that our staff are handling animals. Uh, and then the other place I typically will observe cross-contamination happening is, is when these animals go to surgery. Our, our classic surgery programs in shelters are high quality, high volume programs, and we're moving a lot of animals through in, in a day. And, and it's really easy to, to lose sight of some of that biosecurity when you're trying to be efficient. Uh, but again, you know, the disease diseases can be spread that way. And so we wanna pay attention to that. One question that comes up is, what about biosecurity when we're dealing with the public? We know that, that people being able to interact with cats is important. Sometimes I walk into shelters and I see signs up that say, don't touch the kittens. Um, and, and I worry about that a little bit. That is protecting them against disease, but are we also reducing their chances of adoption? We know stress in the shelter is our biggest risk factor for disease. And if they get, you know, if, if people are able to interact with them and, and they get adopted, that will actually take care of that highest risk factor, right? So it's about balancing that risk. Uh, we, we want our adopters to be able to interact. And so what are we comfortable and what are we able to oversee to ensure compliance, right? Um, I would love it if all of our potential adopters wore gloves or washed their hands in between animals, but sometimes that's asking a lot. And, and so hand sanitizer in this situation, while we know it's not ideal, uh, compliance with a, you know, a, a lesser protective mechanism is better than, than no compliance with the best one, right? So again, we just want to balance, balance that risk um, with compliance and potential adoption conversion. Now let's talk about prevention. Like we talked about earlier, vaccination does not completely prevent infection. Biosecurity plays a role, right? But as we talked about, we know we're never going to eliminate these pathogens in our cat populations. Even healthy cats can, can be positive for some of these bugs. So our number one way that we prevent upper respiratory in our shelter cats is by reducing stress, reducing crowding, and reducing time in the shelter. Again, the most important thing that study after study has shown us the single biggest factor is going to be time in the shelter, right? You don't even need a vet on staff to be able to, to, to do this for our shelter cats. And so we have data that actually looks at feeling upper respiratory disease in shelters and what those risk factors are. And so here are a couple of those studies. Length of stay, single biggest risk factor, period. There are other things that we can also do that reduce chances of URI, and, and there are things that reduce stress. We can give our cats more space. So greater than eight feet of floor space has been shown to be protective against upper respiratory disease. And two or fewer housing moves during their first week of stay in the shelter. And that includes moves to clean. So again, when we talk about spot cleaning versus deep cleaning kennels every day, uh, we can also look at things like, you know, when the cat comes in and they get placed in an intake area and then they get moved to a, to a stray hold area and then they get moved again to an adoption area. So if we can reduce that and just put them in one kennel and allow them to stay there, then that's a better option option. And, and then we know, right, from other research, the diseases like herpes in particular are activated by stress. And the study on the right here actually shows us that, yes, stress does increase their chances of URI in the shelter. Again, reduce length of stay, most important thing, minimize movement. Like I mentioned, we, if we can spot clean instead of deep clean, uh, Floor space is important and a great way for us to, to provide that floor space for cats is to provide double compartment housing. So if we can buy kennels that are already double compartment or put portals in our kennels like the cat in the photo. Another important thing for low stress housing is to provide separate areas for eating and for litter boxes for our shelter cats. And then I always wanna think about, you know, again, movement is stressful. And so are there, if we need to do things to our shelter cats, do treatments, other, is there an option to bring the supplies or the treatments to the cat instead of bringing the cat to a different room, to a grooming area or a medical room? Here is a schematic from UC Davis that demonstrates some low stress cat housing. And, and we can talk through this. So this is double compartment, right? With a separate area for eating and litter box. We wanna pay attention to things like noise, right? If we can uh, auditorily separate our cats from our dogs, then that's less stressful for our cats as well as visually separate too. 
The kennel in this picture actually has barred doors instead of plexiglass that it provides better ventilation and it allows adopters to interact with cats. Now, again, there is the risk of disease transmission, um, but it, you know, in practice, uh, let's, let's mitigate risk as much as possible, but still allow our adopters to interact with our animals. There's a scratching surface in this kennel that allows our cat to practice normal behavior. Uh, and there's, there's a hiding place. And so that's gonna be really important is to provide some hiding places for our cats. One of the common things that I hear in shelters when we start talking about placing portals and actually leaving those portals open is that we're reducing our number of kennels by half won't that restrict how many cats we can save. Well, the reality is when you actually look at what happens time after time, shelter after shelter that does this, they, they take the plunge and they do it. Length of stay decreases for the cats in these kennels. They're healthier, they're less stressed, so they have less upper respiratory disease, and so they move faster to adoption. Then what happens? We can move more cats through, this, through a smaller number of kennels because they're staying for less time. And ultimately we end up being able to save more cats. And the cats that we're saving are healthier cats. Here's some other options. If we can't place portals in our kennels or we, we need more optimal housing, let's get creative. Think about placing cats in offices or using some one of these cat towers, right? So these can be set up in lobby spaces to showcase some of our more confident cats. Uh, or I've, I've certainly seen shelters repurpose spaces, spaces that were originally designed as offices or as meet and greet rooms uh, and, and altering those so they are, are useful as group housing rooms. So, so get creative with what you have to work with. When we do talk about group housing, we, we need to think about providing more space for individual cats. So if we group house, that, that number of square feet that we wanna provide per cat goes up to 18 square feet, right? So more than if they're individually housed. We wanna to try to keep the numbers of cats in group housing small and monitor their behavioral interactions. Again, for some cats living in group housing is great. It's a source of enrichment for them, but for some cats, it can be really stressful. If we are using group housing, we wanna to try to, to borrow a page from production medicine and use what we call all in all out movement. What that means is we, we put some, a group of cats together in a room and we don't, once cats move out, we don't replace those individual cats. We wait for that entire room to become empty before we, we deep clean and then we put new cats back in it. And that's for a couple of reasons. Every time we change an individual in the room in that group, that, that's a source of stress for both that cat and the other cats in the room. And so we wanna pay attention to that. And there's always the risk of disease introduction. We don't really recommend group housing for kittens of unrelated litters, just because that risk of disease transmission is gonna be higher with them, um, but definitely an, a potentially an option for, for adult cats. What about upper respiratory disease after adoption? So if this is something to, to have a chat with your doctors about, we are about to move them from the shelter to a, a new situation, a potentially stressful situation. The move itself is stressful, totally new environment, right? There is a reasonable chance that this might cause a flare up in, in these cats right after they get home. Uh, a lot of times we're combining uh, this move to a new home with anesthesia for, for spay or neuter surgery as well, right? Uh, this is something where we, we want our, our staff that are answering the phones and taking these calls to know how to coach these adopters. This is a situation where, in fact, it may not be uh, a time when you want to rush that cat right back to the shelter or right to the vet, right? Again, these are diseases of stress. And so for a mild infection, it may be better to just monitor at home to, to wait and watch. We also wanna counsel our adopters about how we reduce stress as much as possible. So slow introductions into the household, providing a space for our newly adopted cat to decompress before, um, before we you know, just turn them loose in the house. If there are other cats in the home, we wanna make some recommendations. Ideally, those cats are vaccinated. Uh, if you do have any other high-risk cats at home, it might be a good idea to keep those cats separate from the new cat for a few days. Uh, the risk is never zero. Again, like we talked about with fosters, uh, for adult vaccinated cats, that risk is actually pretty low. But again, it's never zero. And so just always something to have a conversation about and, and make recommendations. I wanna talk about vaccines in the shelter environment, right? In, in the case of our upper respiratory bugs, vaccines, while they don't prevent infection completely, they are still important in reducing severity of disease and potentially reducing transmission. So they are still an important part of our prevention strategy. And so here are a few additional comments about vaccines in general and shelters. Anytime we can, we wanna choose modified live vaccines as opposed to other kinds like recombinant vaccines. 
modified live vaccines work faster and they provide a stronger antibody response, stronger protection against these bugs. So choose modified live vaccines when that's an option. For cats, we wanna choose FERCP, not the chlamydia portion. So just plain FERCP. We need to make sure that our vaccines stay refrigerated. Uh, I know that we love to use these little mini fridges and shelters because they're super convenient and we can put them in places, for example, in our intake areas or our admission areas. But we have to use these with caution. Uh, because they are so small, they may not maintain temperature. And so it's important to make sure that our fridges are maintaining temperature. Get one of those digital thermometers that'll, that will keep track of the maximum and minimum temperatures over a 24 hour period. Or some of these newer thermometers are actually linked to cell phones and will provide alarms if they're not maintaining temperature. So we can be sure that our vaccines are effective. Uh, if these vaccines don't, aren't maintained at, at the colder temperatures, then they won't be effective. It's important for any vaccines that we have to mix. So FERCP is one of them. Uh, so we mix up the liquid portion with the powder portion. You wanna wait until right before you give these to, to mix them up. Um, They're only good for around 30 minutes to an hour after mixing. And so ultimately the, the best option is to not mix it until right before you give it. I know, again, we like to do things and be really efficient in shelters and, and pull all of our vaccines up for the whole day, but we, we wanna use caution with that and really only pull up the ones that you're right about to use. If we are having to go out into the shelter to administer those vaccines, uh, they keep those vaccines on ice in a cooler. An important comment, uh, we talked a little earlier, but really let's get into vaccines in young animals. Um, cats are born or obtain during early nursing maternal antibodies from their mom. This is protection um, that, that they'll have initially against some diseases if the mom had protection. These maternal antibodies, they decline over time but they don't decline at a predictable rate. Uh, we, we can never know how quickly they decline or when an animal will become unprotected. It can be different even in individual kittens or, or puppies in the same litter. The challenge is that these maternal antibodies while they're present interfere with our vaccines. We do know the maternal antibody is gone in all animals by 16 weeks of age. For some it's much, much earlier but the latest will be around 16 weeks of age. The challenge here is because we don't know, we have to assume that those animals aren't protected. So even if we've been vaccinating on a shelter schedule that starts at, at four weeks of age and we've been you know, on the dot doing it every two weeks, they could have had you know, six or seven vaccines and we still can't consider them protected because we don't know for sure. They might be, but they also might not be. And so we do have to, have to treat them as if they're still vulnerable. We can consider them protected once they've reached 16 weeks of age, plus have had two vaccines at that time, right? And so usually this is the 16 week vaccine and the 18 week vaccine. All right, let's talk a little bit about outbreaks. We, I mentioned earlier, right, that one of the things that we can see is panleukin shelters that causes things like sudden death. And so oftentimes, um, if we're worried about something like a, a virulent Khaleesi virus outbreak, we need to look into other things as well to, to ensure we don't have something else going on. Is it you know, cumulative effects of crowding and sanitation or other diseases that are mimicking it, right? Something like panleuk. Uh, and, and so look into those things. Most feline Khaleesi virus outbreaks actually have a, a contributing cause in addition to that virus. My number one takeaway for all of you, if you do think you're, you have an outbreak on your hands, it's to ask for help. So a lot of what I do in my role with best friends and, and there are other veterinarians, all the shelter medicine academic programs have outbreak consulting uh, and they can help walk you through what this outbreak looks like in your shelter. And they can take you step-by-step step, uh, through what it means to respond to that outbreak in order to save the most cats possible. So really that's, that's my big takeaway here. We can do, do a risk assessment in order to decide how we wanna handle things if we do think we have an outbreak on our hands. And really that's, that's looking at how severe are our worst cases, right? So if, if we have a strain, for example, of Khaleesi that's affecting healthy and vaccinated adult cats, uh, my response to that is gonna be a lot different than if I have a strain that's just affecting young kittens and is only causing mild disease. The reality here is that every outbreak is going to be different and every shelter is going to be different and, and you have to treat it and manage it as such. And again, that's where folks like me or folks like the shelter medicine academic programs come in. We can help you work through those details. Uh, environmental decontamination, once you get through that outbreak, is going to be important. Again, so we don't, so we actually finish that outbreak once we treat affected cats. <clears throat> 
Now let's talk about some broader shelter impacts of what we've discussed regarding upper respiratory infection. Length of stay, so what is that, right? Length of stay, time usually measured in days that an animal spends in the shelter. Why does length of stay matter? It is the most important factor for illness, right? Several studies have shown, specifically for upper respiratory and shelter cats, that this is our biggest factor. If they do end up getting sick, right, then we have to treat them. And so they end up staying even longer and, and the longer length of stay, uh, they also have reduced welfare and potentially are at higher risk of losing their lives in some shelters, depending on what the resources are to treat and house those cats. Uh, sometimes I hear shelters say, well, we're not euthanizing cats for space. Uh, but if, if you're euthanizing cats for upper respiratory disease, then I would push back a little bit on that and, and ask you to really critically examine what's going on. We know this is a disease of stress and, and happens when cats remain in the shelter for a long time. Uh, and, and so it, that is actually something that we have to critically look at. Like this day also matters, right? Because that means increased costs to care for those animals, right? And supplies and labor. And then and a longer length of stay for individual animals means decreased overall capacity at the shelter. So we'll, we'll talk through a super simple example of this, right? So say we have a shelter that has 10 cat cages. In the first shelter, our average length of stay for cats is seven days. So how many cats can we house at the shelter and move through our system in one week? And that shelter is only 10 cats. What about a similarly sized shelter? Same thing, 10 cat cages, but their average length of stay is only one day. Well, how many cats can we move through this shelter in one week? 70 cats, right? I understand the math in this example is super simple, right? But this is a bonus effect of reducing our length of stay, right? It's, it's we get more life-saving. We, we can move more animals through our same number of cages with our same number of staff, and ultimately we save more lives. So what are some of our strategies to decrease length of stay? Something that we call fast tracking for highly adoptable animals. As it turns out, many of our most highly adoptables are adorable little kittens. These are the ones that are most vulnerable to disease, including upper respiratory infection. So let's, let's identify those animals early and let's do what we can to move them through the system as quickly as possible. Reconsider quarantine periods. So quarantine periods, while there are good intentions there, it's to, to, to wait and see if an animal is going to break with infectious disease, right? So quarantine is for healthy animals while we're waiting to see if maybe they break. Isolation, in contrast, is for sick animals that are showing signs of disease. And so that's different. Quarantine is hanging on to healthy animals, waiting to see if they develop disease. And we actually want to reconsider those. Again, if our biggest factor is length of stay, the best thing we can do for them is actually move them through the system faster. So decrease those quarantine periods and move them through. We want to prevent disease in all the ways that we've talked about, right? Because if they get sick, then they have to stay in the shelter longer for treatment. Identify if there are any bottlenecks to flow in the shelter, other places where we get hung up, whether that's administrative or paperwork wise. Sometimes it's for various treatments, for example, like sterilization surgery. If we can do things like managed intake, right? So if we can plan ahead and, and know based on the appointment schedule, when we're gonna have larger numbers of animals coming in, we can plan for that. Um, open selection. So even if animals are still on their stray hold and they're not eligible for an adoption, it's still making them visible to the public. So folks can identify those animals that they, that they want to potentially adopt them when they become available. And then as soon as that stray hold is up, those animals can go out. And then it's strategies like daily rounds, so daily population rounds that involves operations folks and folks from the medical team, where they do a physical walkthrough of the shelter, and you look at every animal and you, you, you evaluate them. What do you need right now? What do you need to, to move through the system faster? Another strategy that shelters can use to, to, to figure out reducing length of stay and to better manage their population is determining what their ideal capacity for care is. Now, capacity for care is essentially a number of animals that you can, can care for, and it's based on a number of factors, including your housing space, your staff time. Uh, sometimes we, we look at actually how many you know, live outcome options we have. Uh, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail in this particular study, but, but it really looks at when we use a capacity for care management model, uh, we reduce length of stay, we keep cats moving through the shelter, and we get improved outcomes, right? More adoptions, decreased shelter death, and decreased illness in the shelter. And so what this, what this is about is really proactively managing our population to keep animals moving and, and to, to get more life-saving outcomes. All right, key points. Preventing upper respiratory in our shelter cats, it's about hygiene and disinfection, 
but really it's about reducing stress and length of stay. We want to use vaccines, right? So vaccinate uh, with appropriate storage and handling of those vaccines, vaccinate on intake uh, and vaccinate according to your shelter schedule. Remember, a big percentage of even healthy looking cats can be shedding upper respiratory pathogens. And, and so because of that, we're never gonna get this disease out of these diseases out of our population. So use our PPE, clean effectively. Potentially any cat can be contagious. And at the end of the day, the most important thing is to get them out of the shelter and into homes. Quick comments on community cats. So what about cats that come in through TNR programs, so trap neuter release programs, or cats that are designated for a shelter neuter return pathway? Again, diseases of stress. What is the shelter if not stressful? And, uh, and if we talk about potentially holding these cats for treatment, in most cases, the only thing that's going to do is make these cats sicker because we're stressing them out and we're holding them in the shelter. I take the opposite approach and I try to move these cats through the shelter as quickly as possible. So really prioritize them for the earliest surgery slots that we can get them in. I do take some extra precautions at surgery. So I will usually intubate these cats, including male cats, if we're not routinely doing that, just because all of that congestion has the, the possibility of clogging up their airways. Uh, in general, I don't medicate them, right? We know our first line antibiotic is doxycycline. We know drugs like Convenia are not reliably effective. Uh, so it's, it's the very, very rare case that, that I would consider using uh, any of those medications. Uh, I definitely don't hold on to these cats to medicate them for the vast, vast majority of those cases. So in summary, take a look at your operations. Take a look at things like quarantine periods do what we can to reduce length of stay. Our, our biggest strategy for prevention of URI in the shelter is moving these cats through as quickly as possible. So don't hang on to them for unnecessary quarantines. Take a look at our biosecurity and our disinfection. These are pathogens that we're never gonna get rid of on our shelter populations. And many, many of our cats can potentially have these even if they're not outwardly demonstrating signs. Um, so let's not spread those bugs in between our cats. Let's check our vaccination schedule. Make sure we're vaccinating on, a, on guidelines that are based on shelter house cats. And let's be sure we're storing and handling those vaccines appropriately. Khaleesi virus shouldn't be a scarlet letter. So outside of rare occasions where we have a really gnarly strain of Khaleesi, the, the risk to other animals in adopter homes and the risk to other cats is small. And really it's no different than any other shelter URI. In most cases, we don't even know for sure that it was Khaleesi virus. Um, so, but, but again, it shouldn't be a scarlet letter that follows that cat through its shelter life and after. And the number one takeaway, right? The most important thing we can do to reduce upper respiratory in our shelter cats is to get them out of the shelter. It's to get them into foster homes or into adoptive homes, period. The most important thing we can do. And again, it's not, you don't even need a vet on staff to, to really put some of these strategies into play to, to get cats out. So here are some resources that you can find on our network page, including sample URI protocols, sample intake protocols, uh, information on biosecurity and sanitation. And thank you all for joining me today.